Um, so what I was gonna, what I sort of like wanted to to make this this sort of session about in general is really a discussion about uh, where we are with 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 blockchain and where we are in sort of like the user adoption. And actually, I'd love to also get your opinion, Dan, on this as well, because you know when we look at how far we've come in blockchain and we've been around for like ten years, right? You you have to ask yourself like, are we actually getting the edges of the network? Right or 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 are we just you know in the sort of like 1993, 1996 level internet, right? If even right, because I guess when you know when uh, America Online was was sending out CD ROMs to everybody like just pure trash, you know, <laughs> uh, I don't think we're at that point yet. No, no, nobody is sending out like CD ROMs of Ethereum. That's kind of like. like Airdrops, right? Airdrops are like the American online CDs. <laughs> that's true. That's a great. That's a great uh, analogy, right? The the airdrops of the, the American online. CDs. Yeah. Okay. So maybe we're past that point, right? Like maybe it's 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 now 1999 or something like that, or, or like you know it's like internet first is feeling like a real thing, yeah. And and now we're gonna like try and turn it into into something of the future, you know. Hmm. One of the interesting kind of things, like when I think about the, the parallels between other technologies and how long it took them to sort of reach um, this sort of aspect of being like uh, ubiquitous and, um, you know, sort of making it really in terms of, of sort of penetration. You sort of think of like the telephone, you think of like radio, you think of like the, the internet, you think of like the smartphone. Um, and each time that we bring out these new technologies, they get shorter and shorter, right? Like, mm. like the telephone was invented in 1876 uh, and had like, you know, mass penetration by the, you know, the 1930s, 1940s. Um, but if you think about like smartphones, right, they came out in 2007 and they were ubiquitous by today, right? Which is, which is kind of crazy, you know? And it's, it's interesting that, you know, blockchain comes out only a couple years after the smartphone, yet the smartphone still is a hostile environment for blockchain. Right? Yeah, like, it's, 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 you talk to people who give demos, I see all these demos of like blockchain technology or like, you know, examples, and people be like, oh, check it out. It's like blockchain, you can use it, it's on your phone, try it out, and people do, and they're like, oh, um, oh, but you can't use Safari. Right, you, you can't use that Safari browser. And the people are like, oh, well, what browser do I need? And they're like, oh, you just download like Firefox or, or something. And then the people are like, oh, but I forgot my Apple password. And then they're like, oh, and then they're like, oh. <laughs> well, guess we can't do anything. <laughs> right, right, and then, and then, and then it's over. Yeah. Right. And those, and, and that's sort of like the edge of the network. That's that's the sort of idea of like the last mile, right? Because it's like all those, you know, farmers who are waiting to get internet for, you know, a decade longer than, you know, we got internet in the, the urban areas. And you sort of like compare that to the idea of how long it took, how long it's going to take, you know, us crypto native people, right? We have crypto right now, but is it going to take another 10 years for other people to get crypto? I mean, I remember giving my my sister, you know, back in something like 2015 or something like that. I actually gave her like a couple Bitcoin, right? like back when it was back when I was just like, yeah, yeah, I have like five bucks, you know, it's fine. <laughs> and she lost them. Yeah. And then years later, when it hits like twenty thousand dollars, I was just like, oh yeah, you still have those Bitcoin. <laughs> She's like, oh. <laughs> yeah, I don't, I don't know where that is. I was like, well, go look for it. <laughs> yes, and, yeah. and she was, couldn't be convinced to look for it. Like it, it was, it was this weird thing where, you know, I, I had this experience with a lot of people because in the early, like Bitcoin days, there was this common thing of like, Hey, uh, let's, let's like give out Bitcoin. Right. Like yeah. it was, it was a thing. Um, I went back to find the people that I like gave Bitcoin to <laughs> They virtually all lost it. <laughs> like I, I think only like one person had actually like kept it, but everyone else just lost it. They were just like <laughs> it was just gone, and they weren't even bothered by it when it was like twenty thousand because they 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 didn't 
they still didn't like register it as being real mm. right yeah. and so i wonder if today the last mile isn't just like laying the pipes out to the farms you know with like broadband internet but it's also laying those final pipes to like people's brains mm. right where, where you finally get them to say oh this is real right mm. like this this makes a difference this is important right. and that's really maybe the hardest challenge mm. right like what what was your what was your first experience with like understanding that this was like real and not just like unicorn money yeah um you know honestly like uh as far as um i don't know i had long accepted it before i mean eat denver 2019 when we used were you there for 2019 using the burner wallet at the food trucks yeah yeah yeah, yeah. that was great i mean i'd long accepted it yeah. before that of course you know like people made money in 2017 so just like the idea of like it having some corresponding value um definitely believe that long before that but just like yeah i think there's something to that being able to actually get some sort of a good with that money and like intrinsically linking it, you know what I mean? Not just as a store of value and then I get cash later and then I use cash for something, but instead just being right. able to trade it directly is kind of like, yeah, really changes your perspective. How about you? Well, Seven years asking you, would, would you buy with it? What's that? What is that? Oh, is asking you, what did I you buy with it? <laughs> Every time I bought sushi. Yeah, they had a sushi truck there. It was amazing. Yeah. <laughs> Poke bowl. That's what it was. Oh, Lane to the buying coffee at the Bitcoin coffee in Prague. Whoa. Yeah. Yeah. And what's kind of crazy about the Bitcoin coffee place in Prague is, is that they actually pay their employees all in Bitcoin too. So it's entirely uh sort of like a closed economy around Bitcoin. Um and it, it was created by some early Bitcoin guys because a lot of people don't know, but the inventor of um, pooled mining is actually Czech from from Prague. So they said wow. like an early early um, early Bitcoin sort of like scene there back in the day. Trezor, the Trezor wallet is also also from Prague. Mm. You know, what is like? Uh, first of all, to the people who are in the chat. We are looking for extra people to come up on the stage <laughs> to discuss so we can hear your voice. So just click on the, the moderation panel button. I don't know if I, I think it's up here. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Uh, it's, it's, or, or there. <laughs> for me, it's down here. Uh, click it. Oh, it's top right for everyone. OK, for me, it's like bottom left. If it's top right, do ask to share audio and video. Join and jump in because this is a discussion. This isn't this isn't going to be a, this isn't going to be, um, you know, just a me talk to you. So, so uh, the more people join in and participate, um, are really going to be great. I know Lane is around. If Lane has a few minutes, I'd love to get him up here as well. Ask to share. I don't see anybody sh sharing. Okay, well, don't be shy. Well, um, so you know something. Oh, there we go. There we go. I clicked. I clicked on the plus button. Uh, Matt's got to bounce. Matt, what was the first thing you bought with, with Bitcoin? Oh, Blake. Awesome. Okay. There he is. Jumping in. Here's Blake. What's up? Am I in here? Welcome. Hey. Yeah, you're in. Awesome. You're in. You got it. We can see. We can hear hey, you. Blake. I clicked also plus on lane, but uh, he didn't show show up. Yeah. So Linway, the, the bridge. Thinking about the bridge in the architecture of Pokemon. I had a slide where, yeah, Crypto NYC, right? Yeah, that's true. <laughs> crypto NYC represents. Hell yeah. <laughs> right on. <laughs> so, the, uh, Lin Wei, I like the idea of the bridge, like even the architecture of Polkadot, right? Like, one of the things that I like to describe the state of like blockchain today and Bitcoin today is this that we have the future ahead of us. Like there's this great Canyon that's like between us and the future. Right. And we've been building this like amazing bridge called blockchain, which is going to get us there. But the last like 15 meters of it just isn't finished. Right. So we like travel all this way 
And it's just not enough to get all the way over to the other side. And one of the interesting things I heard recently from um, some people in the space was, ah, Lane joined. Welcome, Lane. What's up, Lane? Um, yeah, crypto NYC full on now. <laughs> <Sorry. Sweet. laughs> uh, one, one of the great things I heard recently from, from someone is, is that a lot of projects in blockchain in general, there are these like really intense uh, problems like user experience problems or interface problems. And what most people are doing is they just sort of like surface the problem to the user and then sort of like wash their hands of it, right? Like they, they, they say, okay, this is sort of like an intractable problem, but we're not gonna solve it. Let the user solve it because they are in charge now. And that sort of created this, you know, um, a really odd situation in terms of, of how we interface with, with blockchain, right? And I think a great example is how we, we connect websites to blockchain and then how we do that like in a secure way, right? So I'm working on Dapp Hero, this, this way of like, you know, connecting websites to blockchain. And one of the things that kind of keeps me up at night in this idea of like, okay, if we, if we build this bridge to the future, and we're talking about, oh, you own your own key, so it's it's safer, you're in control of your own money. Suddenly you go to a website, right? And, and you know, you're like, uh, I was just on a site earlier today, one of these DeFi sites, and they're like, okay, approve your die. I was just like, okay, how much die am I gonna approve? And they're like, just one with like some scientific notation of how large the number that you're approving is. Right. And and that is a perfect example of like just surfacing friction to the user, because in this case, we have, you know, MetaMask, which is our sort of like secure interface to to the blockchain. But we're really we're signing absolutely anything. Right? What's the point of of holding our own keys if we just leave the door open or we just like, you know, we let anybody walk in. Right? It's like the money's in the safe. Go on in, check it out. It's awesome. It's a great <laughs> save, right? And, and that's kind of like what we end up being confronted with when we think about like how we make these things user friendly, right? And, like, and how we actually like make something that people can really use in the end. You know, especially in the early days, a lot of people would yell about like, oh, not your keys, not your Bitcoin, right? Like if you don't, if you don't control it yourself, it doesn't, it doesn't really belong to you. But if you're not an educated user, you know, does does money really belong to you? If you, you know, there's that phrase like, you know, a fool and his money are soon parted, right? Like, is there really any difference between a fool and like uh, can't read hexadecimal and his money are, are soon <laughs> parted, right? Like, because a lot of times, you know, you, you don't know what you're signing. And the more, the, the, the part that's sort of like worse beyond that is there's really no way for you to know what you're signing. Right. And there's, you know, our, our sort of ecosystem is, is primed for the idea of like the long con, you know, where people start something today and it's like a, a really helpful today and they run it, you know, for years and it's a really solid thing. And then one day the, the, the price of Ether crashes and we're all panicking and we all want to get out of our, our CDPs really quickly. And so, you know, that day we don't double check the address that we've connected to. Right, like that. That day, we're not reading the JavaScript in the the front end to like be sure. Right, and that's the day when you're clicking yes, I approve one to the e eighteen decimal places, and that is you know, I mean, I'm not sure what you think about this, like Lane, but but that seems to like it seems to violate everything in a way because if it doesn't work in those dangerous moments does it work at all right like i could leave money on the street i could leave my wallet on top of a car right and as long as nobody steals it it's perfectly safe <laughs> right but but as soon as you exist in a world where people snatch wallets off the car or you know inject javascript into your page what's the point right and uh, i would love to you know Lane and Dan, if you have some thoughts on this, Blake as well, although we lost your video. Oh, um, I can see Blake's video. You're good. Oh, oh, I can't see his video. I just have like a, it's funny because Blake's hair is very different from the, the <laughs> generic cutout of a user that I'm getting here. Oh, <laughs> so someone else can't there. see Blake's video. That's weird. I can see it fine. Maybe try reloading. I don't know. 
Uh, if I try reloading, I don't read that. You, you shouldn't. <laughs> the whole thing's gonna fall apart. <laughs> the whole thing will fall apart. You know, but this is really like you know when we talk about you know sort of fulfilling the decentralization principles, it's not enough to just like surface the the difficulty of this to the user. You know, the reason why banks hold our money is because people are shit at building safes. Right, like they're really, they're you know, I build a really like crap safe, so banks did it for me, right? But but to say, okay, well now I have my keys, but you know the the you know I sort of give this um, um, example pretty often where you're switching wallets, right? You go from like MetaMask, to like Portis, to like Opera, and you have to like take your seed out, right? And then you have to like copy it over, and it's a little bit like you know, taking your gold out of like Fort Knox, putting on a wheelbarrow and just like broad daylight, just like <laughs> wheeling it across the street, being like, oh, but I, it's my, you know, I have my keys, you know? I mean, I think Dennis, just one of your points that I want to very much agree with, which is that like, we can be using the strongest cryptography in the world. It can be, you know, we can have perfect forward secrecy. We can have quantum resistance and all these fancy things, but there are still these like, single points of failure like you're talking about right like like the the moment when you're caught with your pants down so to speak or or when you're wheeling your wheelbarrow full of you know gold or bitcoin or whatever across the street like without a doubt these choke points happen like this has happened to me as well uh and you know like yeah, you know make one tiny little mistake in your uh in your you know address that you're sending something to even if you're sending it to yourself and you're kind of hosed and it's a single point if it's a sorry weakest what is it weakest link in the chain Right. So maybe like yeah. our UX is not good until like that's not possible anymore. Right. Right. And and that's a, you know, um, Blake is always telling me this sort of like advice about like trading, which is you, you shouldn't be trying to like mess around for like just a few dollars. Right. You, know, you shouldn't be like trading, trying to make a couple dollars. Right. You're really waiting for these like big moves, things that make a difference. And when we think about that in the context of like DeFi, Right, like how brilliant would it be, for example, if I were to like create some sort of lending protocol, everybody loves Denison, right? We we all put our money into it. I spend about a year giving you 30% APR. And then in in, a, in the middle of the night on Christmas day, right, 2023, I just take it all, right? I upgrade the contract and I, and I walk away, right? And and that's, that's an interesting point because if you look at a lot of our ecosystem, how does trust get get built? in our, our ecosystem, right? Why, why do we trust MakerDAO? Why do we trust Compound? Well, because lots of people talk about Compound, right? Like, why do I put my money in Compound? Well, you know, everyone's talking about Compound. It sounds cool. I want to put my money into it too, right? And of course, when I put my money into it, why do I do it? Oh, well, the, the website looks cool. Like, it looks pretty legit, right? But if we talk about like, okay, you know, Grandma here is about like, you know, the, the, the advantages of like, you know, DeFi. What is, what does the compound website look to her? Right. Yeah, Matt, exactly. Until, until a DNS hash. Right. <laughs> but, but no, that's, that's everything, right? Like that, that's truly in many ways, everything. I mean, there's some things that underpin our ecosystem that could destroy the trust of the entire entire like oh yeah right click save web page web page my 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 dad my dad still tries to do this he'll like go to his bank web page and like look at something i don't know like a check or something that he wrote and he'll try to like save the web page i'm like dad it's not the way things work anymore you can't save anything or or he'll do the same thing he'll go to like a google you know cloud uh google docs document that i send him and he'll try to like save it and i'm like dad it doesn't work that way <laughs> yeah Sure, sure. So, Denison, I guess the question I have is like, do you think that what we're building or some version of what we're building or something built on top of what we're building will ever work for, for those types of people? Well, I think the question is, does PayPal work for those kinds of people? Because I think the answer is yes, right? Like PayPal works for everybody and they've spent a lot of effort to make sure it works for everybody. Yeah, but it, works you know, until if, it doesn't work and then it breaks horribly. That's true again. That, that, that's true. It, it definitely works until they don't like you, right? Which, which it definitely I, works. I feel like this, this argument you're making is actually our best, like, like argument, right? Is that like you put your trust in PayPal, and then you 
give away the keys and then the minute they decide you look like someone that's a terrorist or whatever their thing is your money's gone you have no recourse you have no way to like and so i guess in theory you know we, right now we have worse ux but at least like the worst ux is is sort of owned up to up front right you sort of like you, you are aware of at least the the potential security risks but i i I thought your point earlier was actually really interesting about this sort of like long con that like was the original Bitcoin scam, right? Like that guy, I forget who it was, scammed everybody, all the big. I remember pirate. Yeah. So it's not just Bitcoin saving environment. I forgot about that. Like, and now you're making me really concerned. <laughs> the whole it's all a scam. You know why you still can. <laughs> Uh, you know, I, I was around during um, Pirate's uh, scam with the Bitcoin Savings and Trust or whatever. And um, I was skeptical. I did not invest. I did not put money in it. And I'm not going to like out the, the early people who did. But the early people who, who put money into it, it was it was everybody. Yeah, it was everybody who was building everything. It you know, like, it like a DAO in Ethereum, right? Everybody put money into the DAO. Everybody. Yeah, right. Every everybody put money into it. How did you know? I mean, I, I remember they like had lo a lunch together. Uh, something like everyone believed it, and they were like, "Yeah, I looked at how he's doing it. Totally seems legit. I'm gonna put all my mm into it. I'm gonna put all this. Mm. Hey, uh, yeah, okay, yeah, maybe not Gap and Wood, right. Right. but but everyone at this, else. At this time, it's different. DeFi yeah. is different. This time is different. Of course, this time is different. But, but these are real <laughs> things that like we have to worry about, you know, like I, I don't, you know, I don't, I, I mean, maybe DAOs are making a stab at like reducing our risk of, um, of, of like the long con of the exit scam. Unless of course a whole bunch of people exit scam everybody together, right? Like mm. governance. It just means that like we have to, you know, we know that you can make a gar cartel of bad people, right? So that, that's entirely possible to do. And it's really worth considering um, how dangerous or how much we are at risk of that, you know? Like I was checking out the other day and I, I think it's quite fine, but if you, if you look at how much ether is locked up in the raft ETH contract, like this, this really unassuming so, contract, I think something like two and a half million ETH. Yeah, that one, I've read like that one. If I, I hope I'm not making a complete idiot of myself here. It's really simple. It's like two, three, four lines of code or something. So like sure. that's a good. That's like maybe not the best example, but I think there are many other things that have millions of dollars or ETH in them, which sure. are way more, which are orders of magnitude more complex. Hmm. Well, here, here's the sort of question I would ask and reply to you on that, right? So you've read the code for Wrapped ETH. I'm sure a lot of people read the code for Wrapped ETH. But who's read the byte code for Rapti? Right? <laughs> like, how many of us have read the byte code for Rapti? Right? I can't read byte code. I've I've read the 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 solidity, right? And and that intra that sort of adds another layer of like intrigue to what we're building, right? Because you know what compiles is very different than what we see, you know, in, in the sort. Well, I mean, hopefully not very different, right? Like this is being recorded, so technically not very different, hopefully. So are you are you saying uh, that are you saying that better crypto UX is is a good thing or it's a bad thing because we start to trust things that have better UX more and those could have that, that could be like a, an abstraction around bytecode that's bad or something like that. Um, you know, one of the things that I've been wondering lately is maybe we should make more explicit how much we are trusting specific things with. Right, the idea of the approve function, right? The, the approve function, the way it's used today, maybe isn't ideal. And that's sort of just to get around the, the UX difficulties of like having people sign things over and over. But in theory, it's actually really solid. You know, users can say, hey, I'm gonna put this money into this thing, but I know how much I'm risking with it, right? And it's gonna be this approve whatever. And that I think is very useful on the smart contract level. What I don't think we've really figured out, though, is how we we bring that sort of explicit agreement up to the the UX level, right? Like when I'm when I'm depositing funds um, into into a smart contract through a UI, 
there are real worries about whether or not I'm actually UI. Like I'm sure most people still get worried whenever they are copy pasting a Bitcoin address to deposit money into an exchange. You know, are they're all at least I'm always wondering. Did, did malware like switch my addresses? Right. You know, like how do I double check that? Yeah. And ten years later, there's still no good way to double check. No, that, there is right. Isn't. Yeah. Even just and, uh, and that and that should keep us up all night. Yeah. Right. Like, you know, because it's not hard to write a, a JavaScript that says if amount less than a million dollars, be a good guy. If million dollars, take it and run. You know. <laughs> So what I kind of wonder when we're talking about like the last mile and making this work in for users is how do we how do we make it a PayPal like experience? And the reason why I do suggest that is is that we can't educate consumers all overnight or all at once. You know, like when the internet first started accepting credit cards, like you know there would be news TV segments where like newscasters would be like. Just a reminder, everybody out there, never put your credit card into a website, right? And 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 somehow we got from there to, you know, I put my credit cards use websites all the time. Until recently, when that service privacy.com comes out, where now I just put a fake credit card number into every site that I ever use, you know? So there, there are things that we still need to build to make this actually like safe and to sort of like build a relationship with the users as they use it. And what I mean by that is when Compound comes out and says, okay, this is the Compound website, why do we all start using Compound, right? It's because we sort of like trust one another and we sort of are on crypto Twitter and people start using Compound. We also need to build some sort of way to be sure that when we use Compound, we're using the same Compound that everyone else says is so awesome, right? And we're talking about above the smart contract level right bitcoin jack ux concerns are very far ux concerns i think are 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 right now the the sort of like thing that is waiting to like bite us right if you look at smart contracts how many die um erc20 tokens are there on on ethereum there's a lot of them mm. right there's a lot of contracts that say hey i'm die and in the early days of Ether Delta, right, where we had decentralized exchanges, that's another like friction point that was just service to the user, where they would have this little thing when you're about to go buy die. They said, "Hey, just be careful to make sure it's really die." Right? right? <laughs> for users, they're like, they're like, "What the heck, man? How do I know it's really die or not?" Right. Uh, so I wanted to highlight. I don't. I don't mean to steal your thunder, Dennison. Like, but I, just no, to, I think um, Sasha here has a really good point. He was saying. Onboarding should start with hosted wallets, not Web3 wallets. This is what Near is doing, last I heard, and I think it's a kind of cool approach. Uh, I don't know, Sasha. Maybe you want to maybe you want to jump on and explain your approach because yeah, I think you guys have a really cool uh, take on the UX question. Jump jump in on the moderation panel because I actually I think I think it's I think you have to point left if you want to go right or something. Oh, no. Really? Yeah, 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 that's it. That's it. That's it. That's yeah, it. obviously on that. <laughs> yes, that's it. <laughs> Because I, I agree with that statement as well. Hey, welcome. Well, welcome. welcome. <laughs> hey. What are what Tell are us what you guys are doing in Yeah, so I mean like we, we talked to a whole bunch of projects out there and heard that uh, putting MetaMask in uh, actually like we started talking to the projects back in the day uh, under assumption people care about scalability. And it turns out like very few uh, projects given how early we're in space cared about scalability. But a lot, like two and a half dozen projects actually mentioned that they want to bring mass market into the space. Uh, like, for example, like a lot of people in gaming space came from AAA uh, gaming projects like Blizzards of the world. And they are used to, uh, for new games, to have like 100,000 gamers to be released uh, on day one or like million, you know. And they jump into the space and they look in the space and they're like, wait, where do I get 100,000 uh, <laughs> gamers? Um, and uh, one of the first things that we heard is uh, is actually not putting MetaMask in front of the users, but kind of like have optionality instead, kind of like what what exists in a way of burner wallet that you discussed earlier, uh, as a, as a default. So you start there, and then you have optionality to move to Web3 wallet. Like you can do it in like three days, you can do it in in a year. It really depends on uh, each individual consideration, like how much value you have locked in uh, in a blockchain application. Yeah. yeah. We need and these. We need these like progressive approaches. These very 
take progressive approaches to things like usability and decentralization. It doesn't, it's not an all or nothing thing. I mean, yes, I know that the Bitcoin maximalists in the room will probably hate me for saying this, but that's my thought. Not, 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 sure. not, not your coin, sure. not your coins, sorry, not your keys, not your coin, right? As uh, Andrea says, it's totally true, but I, but if it's five or $10 worth, that's fine, right? You need to optimize for, for usability in yeah. the beginning. Right. Yeah. yeah, absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. If you're just starting a game I mean, out and you have no value in your account and you just want to play the game, it's like, why do I need to learn like what a you know private key is and like download all that and write it on pieces of paper? I don't care yet. But if I like get a sword and it's worth a lot of money, it's like, how do I know I own this? Let me take it off, you know, and make sure I can trade it with people and actually use it like that. I think that's a big, yeah, that's a big point. Yeah, when I was talking off that to Ranil, who runs like audios, he was saying like that every every use case is different, you know, like it, it, it like we, we need to treat it as everything is different. Like if I ask you like, hey, like uh, here's my wallet, I can give you five dollars for one use case that makes sense versus for other one. Here's my wallet. Here's all of my personal information. And here you go. This is very different. And so like I think every use case should be kind of like thought very differently versus kind of like having the same model for every single use case. Mm. James, yeah. thanks for dropping that link in the chat there. I don't know if, if folks know who James is and what the Abridge project is, but they're doing some really exciting, important work on incremental decentralization in UX and Ethereum as well. So, yeah, they have, a, they have a very awesome project uh, that works on Telegram that you have to check out. It's very cool. I think this is actually a really cool project because they're trying to increase, from my understanding, trying to increase the engagement around like uh, governance uh, type of situations where people don't engage as much and, and so now like building better interfaces for this maybe will actually lead to a lot higher usage. Hmm. Yeah, and that's really important because when you see, when you look at like usage numbers on Ethereum at least, what we see is, is that people come to use things like DeFi because there's an incentive, right? There's an opportunity to make money. And people will jump through, people will jump through hoops to make money, right? If you say, hey, you know, write down 12 words on a piece of paper and you get five bucks, people are like, all right, fine, but it better be five bucks at the end of it, right? But if you talk about like, hey, write down your 12 words and at the end of this, we can all like debate something and vote. Right. Maybe no, <laughs> right? And, that, and that's where I think you start to see like fall off in governance, right? You, you start to see like, fall offs in, in, in these ideas and applications that are really exciting. They're about decentralization, they improve society, but you know, the friction to, to being involved in them is so difficult and so high, right? Like, and, and that that's a real buzzkill for a lot of like applications, like games, for example, right? Things where the, the sort of like payoff for you is very like theoretical, Right? Like, for example, every time I log into Coinbase, they say, hey, you could earn $50 in, in EOS if you just complete these tasks, right? I don't even think it's 50 bucks, but it's like 50 if you do like all their like things, right? Dennis said we lost you for about 10 seconds. Are oh, you asking me for 10 seconds? Well, I was just, just basically saying that like the friction is so high in so many things that you don't start, right? Yeah. And you know, so when your Bitcoin Jack is talking about forgetting about the mask, forget about the masses for now, that's way too far off. And I would say it's been 10 years, right? Like we've been at this for 10 years. We went from no smartphones to 3.2 billion smartphones in 10 years. And the same amount of time we went from Satoshi to tens of thousands. I don't know how many like real users are using blockchain, but you know, in the developer scale and the developer count, right? We're certainly not, we're not out of the tens of thousands realm. You know, active developers were probably, you know, well under 10,000, right? So, so when we talk about like, oh, the, the, you know, forget about the masses, maybe that was what we've been doing too long. Right, like the, the the just the statement, hey, read the the code to know what you're doing is is by itself exclusionary of of people being able to participate of it, and it's I, not just. Sorry, yeah. please finish your thought. <laughs> no, 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 please, 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 please. Well, uh, I, I, I mean, just gonna say. It. Oh, here. <laughs> no, 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 no. Finish, finish, oh, your okay. finish your thought. Finish your thought. Finish your thought. Uh, I forgot it now, so you have to go. <laughs> 
I, I, I okay, fine. I, I, I like to be controversial. Sometimes it kind of spikes the conversation up. Like I, I'm gonna kind of play devil's advocate here, and um, I'm gonna agree with Bitcoin Jack in the sense that maybe the goal here shouldn't be bringing this stuff to the masses. Like maybe that doesn't need to happen ever. Maybe that's okay if it doesn't happen. Maybe that shouldn't be our goal here. Uh, of course, it depends a lot on the project and the application. Um, and I'm as excited about Web3 and self-sovereignty over you know, data and identity and things like that as, as anybody at this event. But like, I don't know, let's just talk about Bitcoin because Bitcoin is simple. Like, is my dad or your grandma ever gonna use Bitcoin? Maybe not, is that okay? Maybe, what, what do you guys think? I think like my parents would use it if it was usable for them, right? Like, it's why? not so... Like, 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 let's assume, okay, let's imagine for sake of argument that it is usable. Like, what problem is it solving? Like, like my, my dad likes US dollars, he likes his credit card, and he likes his bank. Like, there's, he doesn't have a problem with money. He, he's not worried about censorship resistance. He's not worried about self-sovereignty. Like, nothing is broken for him. Uh, Bitcoin Jack is loving us. Uh, <laughs> I mean, You're absolutely it's, right. It's a valid point. <laughs> it's a, it's a, you know, it is a valid point. Let me, let me say one last thing. We, we, we tend in this community to drink a lot of Kool-Aid and kind of like presuppose this argument that like this is for the masses. And, you know, part of me believes that's true, but but it's just I don't think we should take it as a given, right? Like we need to argue it from first principles. Sure. Well, I have a counter to that. And that would be, yeah. you know, Maybe your dad loves the U.S. dollars, right? I love U.S. dollars too. <laughs> I love dollars. <laughs> uh, but your dad probably also loves his mortgage, right? And he probably has to have title insurance on that mortgage because the U.S. government and local state governments they won't verify, even though they they don't sell you, but they they process your title and they let you buy the title and you have to register your property title with the government, they actually give you no guarantees that's actually a title, right? Which is kind of crazy. I mean, imagine getting married, but getting no guarantees you're actually married, right? Like, or, or having your kid born and getting no guarantees that the government actually recognizes that you even have children. We don't get guarantees from the government for anything, ever. Right, like that's not the way the government works. Except, yeah, I don't get a, I don't get a guarantee that they're not going to give me some BS tax bill. I don't get a guarantee that they receive my tax payment. I don't get it. Like, I don't get a guarantee that like you know when I need to renew my passport, there's going to be someone there to renew it. Like that's just not the the nature of the relationship between us and the government today. And yes, it pisses me off, but like I don't know that the older generation cares or that most people care about that because they're used to. Well, it. well, they definitely care, right? Because with mortgage mortgages, like title titles are a really great example, right? Like, okay, maybe the government doesn't guarantee you anything, but they require you to do it, right? So, it, and this is it's, it's a very crappy one-way relationship. Like, I have to do all this shit for the government. The government doesn't do. It's not true to say they don't right. do anything for me, but like, uh, it, yeah. it, it doesn't feel. You know. well, but, th but this is a great example where, you know, you could do something like have a title on, right, on Bitcoin specifically, right? You could have your title there and then that provides real utility to your dad, right? Doesn't wait, have to wait, pay wait, title let's, 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 let's keep going because this is helpful. Like, where is the real utility for my dad? Again, I'm kind of playing devil's advocate here. Okay. Yeah. Like, I, I, think I, I, don't, I don't think he. I don't think yeah. he perceives that anything is broken today. Is what I'm saying. Like the system, as imperfect as it is, it kind of works well enough for him. He's not. He's not on a sanctions list, and he, he likes dollars. <laughs> I, would, I would also mention the use cases that people can like really uh, care about. I think it starts with like use cases that people care about, and and really good product teams joining the space. For example, like Audios, the music streaming service, right? It launched just in September, and it already had like 200 or 300 months active listeners. And the reason this is because uh, musicians love it, right? Uh, Spotify doesn't allow for this service. Uh, for essentially, like if you have reused content of other musicians, you cannot submit it on Spotify or SoundCloud. And in audio's case, it is uh, possible, right? And so as a result, a whole bunch of musicians telling each other about it, and as a result, a whole bunch of other people joining it because this is a place for exclusive content. Like I really hope they're not gonna be, you know, next um, uh, Napster, like I really hope we'll succeed here because music labels already sending season disease 
uh, but uh, th that's a really good example. I think it will happen um, essentially in digital art, in, in blogging communities and podcasting communities. What I think about it is like it starts as a marketplace, mm -hmm. but then there'll be economy on top of it as well. And so you have more direct participation between creator and a community. And also there'll be people who'll be able to essentially say what this web service should have. For example, uh, I want to have social sharing of the music. And you would, you would ask like, well, why Spotify doesn't have yeah. it? And that's also was actually enforced by labels. We decided that, like, well, social sharing actually would lead to um, more of a content like uh, that's not as useful for mu music labels to be shared, and 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 so I think we'll see this world in where like not only economically people will be more directly participating in, uh, but also governance of it uh, will dictate kind of like what sure. are the functionality of the web service will be. I think that's a great uh, example too, example. because early hip hop, for example, sampled from everybody all the time, and then they weren't allowed to do it anymore. And then the whole like sort of like just sampling for people and just making it like music that you could share stopped because of the legal risk to it was too high, right? I mean, maybe now it sounds like we're talking about like let's use these blockchain to subvert the rules, but but that's a real thing, right? And actually, um, I just saw an article re recently about how there's a some software is using the Library of Congress's like archive of music to let people freely just sample and make you know the sort of like old school style hip hop again, right? And and audience is a, is a really good example of of being able to enable these use cases that maybe exist outside of you know what copyright law might dictate. There was um, on this topic there was a really fun project recently that some of you folks might have seen. This was a, maybe a month or two ago. It was a team of researchers who created every single possible 8-bit MIDI uh, you know, sound clip that was some fixed length, 30 seconds or something, like, like millions of them, billions, whatever it is. And of course, it's MIDI and it's 8-bit, so it's like the data's not that great. So they published this data somewhere and they said, there it is. We've published every piece of music that can ever be published ever, forever, <laughs> and we now have a copyright on all of it. Let's, you know, let's throw a wrench into the system and see what happens. <laughs> I love that. I love that. We should just now randomly generate like novels and songs and just like <laughs> copyright all of them. Once. So it just goes to show how broken the system is. Um, and, and Sasha, just to respond to your point, like I like that argument, which I would frame as like the platform play argument a little better than the my grandma using Bitcoin argument. All, all due respect to people who, who, who do want their grandmas to use Bitcoin. Um, yeah, you just put the tools out there and let creators build things that they can't build on existing platforms. That's, yeah. okay now, but that's a pretty compelling argument. That's what Denison said too, is if, if there's something that people want, money, he said, and originally they'll jump through hoops, right? I mean, we have some usability problems, but they'll jump through hoops if you have that feature that their regular app doesn't have that you can actually right. provide them through it. And uh, that, that could be, <laughs> sorry. <laughs> oh, sorry. Uh, Lane, if you remember, like when we were when we were in Buenos Aires for Youth Buenos Aires, right? And we, we spent um, a night or two at that one apartment the woman who was renting it, uh, she was an artist. And if you remember what she talked about, she was a part of this project called uh, Time Bank, which predates blockchain uh, by a lot. And it's it's funny because it's it actually sounds exactly like a blockchain, right? That's Just right. With I remember we, we walked into this Airbnb and she started explaining this and she was like, so what are you guys working on? We're like, well, there's this thing called the blockchain. How much time do you have? <laughs> <laughs> and we explained it to her and she's like, oh, it's like time bank. And the whole idea was is that, so time bank as she explained it at the, at the time, <laughs> no pun intended, was you, someone shows up and you do something for them. You, you spend some X number of hours doing something for someone and you earn X number of hours from somebody else in the time bank system. Hmm. So the, these artists, hey Jake, welcome. So so these artists basically were were able to like share time value with one another globally in this just sort of like trusted system. You know, you would basically just show up and say, hey, I have five hours of time bank time, and then someone would be like, okay, welcome. Um, I'll I'll do X, Y, or Z for you, and you could spend your time bank time with one another. And it was it was kind. Of, I mean, it sounds like a very like 1960s sort of uh, sort of cooperative type of idea, but maybe it even predates that. I mean, in a way, it sounds like you know very utopian. 
But that's a great idea of you know what we're trying to do with blockchain that regular people would be interested in, right? Like when we talk about the last mile, the, the idea is like, okay, we can build amazing things, right? We're all developers or we all know developers or we're all sort of involved in this. But what are we what are we doing so that we can go from where we are now to grandma's using it? And maybe grandma doesn't have to be like literally sending, you know, Satoshis out and like with, with, with blockchain, right? But maybe we do need to, to find a way that the services that she is using are powered by blockchain. And Bitcoin Jack here makes a great point. Same talking points and examples from 10 years ago. And that's the, that's, thanks Bitcoin Jack, because that's the last <laughs> mile why the bridge to the future still needs to be built. That's sort of the point. We're still talking about the same things as 10 years ago. So there's something that either this revolution is just going to take a lot longer than we expect, right? Like maybe we just dramatically underestimated how much we actually have to build, or we're still missing something really key in what we are building, right? Because if we say, well, grandma's never going to use it, but, uh, you know, banks will use it. Well, then we're building a greater SWIFT and mostly we're doing it kind of like for free. And, and, and that's, that's not an awesome feeling just, just, just to be building this for free for the banking infrastructure, right? So, you know, when, when you talk about like, you know, Bitcoin Jack again, um, it, it not being like the, the target market isn't regular people. If it's not regular people, really, what is decentralization for? Because, you know, Facebook, Apple, Netflix, right? They can get together over cocktails and make decisions in a pretty decentralized way. Right, like that—that that feels like a, a, a DAO that maybe runs a stable coin that, like, one of them maybe runs. Right, that's decentralization from the 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 company's point of view. Right, it's not just one of us. But what do we? What is it when it talks to to the rest of us? Right, like, what do we have to build to to make sure that this is something that we're all using? And does that mean that maybe we have to all be able to produce some sort of like value on top of it? Right. And, and a great example, I think of that is something like Shopify, where, you know, I've given this example in talks before. But in 2003, the idea of you selling candles on the Internet with uh, you know, accepting credit cards was a crazy idea. Right. And of course, now Shopify comes along and they're kind of decentralizing the economy in many ways. Right now, you can manufacture something from your home, even if you're only going to sell two of them. Right. And, and that's, that's a powerful thing. And so how do we solve the problems that we still have to get from where we are today, which is further along than 10 years ago, but, but maybe it could be a lot further along, right? Yeah, I think, you know, we might have the same talking points as 10 years ago, but I do think a lot of the talking points are more mainstream than they used to be. You take, for example, data privacy, like, I mean, you couldn't even 10 years ago, you couldn't even convince me that that was an important thing. Like you could have said like, oh, companies have your data. And it's just like, OK, yeah, I gave them that data. You know, like <laughs> I wouldn't really thought too much about it. But now, like it's a mainstream thought that a lot of people think about. They think, what does Facebook do with my data and how much data do they collect about me? Um, there's a lot of things, you know, like now with the federal government uh, government bringing all this money into the economy, a lot of people are looking at that. And these are talking points that I think are on the top of people's consciousnesses. Whereas maybe like, yeah, 10 years ago, we weren't thinking about it as much. So yeah, I mean, it's almost like a, the downer side of the argument because I think it will take a lot longer to get that mainstream, but we are getting there, right? Like there, there's definitely progress um, and you know, there's uh, yeah, I, st I still think that there's a lot of UX stuff that needs to be figured out. Um, a lot of things that people need to adopt in order for us to get there. Like I just built uh, DAI into a website to be able to pay in DAI. And it's like you were saying, I all I did was essentially made like wallets that people could put the DAI into and it shows, okay, you put the DAI in there and then you can go ahead and check out, right? But I don't give them like MetaMask or anything like that because I wanted them to be able to use anything. But the friction is then on the user. Right. The user has to say, like, oh, now I need to go learn about what die is to put that in there. So there's still like a lot of friction, a lot of things that I think we can continue to work on. Um, I think we're making progress just slower than everybody wants. <laughs> I think it's 
it's also worthwhile, you know, when we talk about, you know, um, incremental decentralization, right? In, in the beginning, you know, there, Bitcoin was, you know, a small group of people, right? Like Satoshi, Gavin Anderson, a few other people on the email list. And it decentralizes by like getting it going further and further out in these rings of people who are using it, right? And, and as more and more people come, get, come into it, we sort of like tend to trust it more and more um, to say that this is, this is more like decentralized. But when we go from that to everybody, right? And when, when we make this truly decentralized, have we really fully thought about what that means in terms of just like organization, right? Like organizing people is extremely inefficient, right? You know, participation in democracy is a very difficult thing, right? Like how are we going to be sure that these things remain useful if we're requiring people to understand them or, or have some sort of like mental load to use them at the same time, if that makes sense. Right? Like imagine if, if voting for the U.S. president had like a literacy test and a property ownership te test, right? Like not all that many people would vote or maybe only a very specific skin color of people would vote, right? And, and we've done that, right? And we kind of have that experience a little bit right now, you know? So Alexander, you know, you're, you're with Nier. Maybe you can talk a little bit about like the philosophy that uh, uh, the team, the near team is thinking about in terms with uh, sort of decentralization and like the ideas of this last mile. Certainly, I, I, I've gone through the near documentation a bit, and the, I, there's a big focus on trying to be more user friendly, where the users are already kind of technically advanced people, but not so technically advanced, sort of like a a, a middle way. Maybe you can speak to to. The, your thoughts or the organization's thoughts about these things as well. Because certainly if you thought the bridge was already built, you wouldn't be trying to build a new bridge. <laughs> right, no, it's definitely not, not built yet. <laughs> Completely on the same page with you. Um, yeah, so the, the, the space today is very small. I would say there are, to your point, like maybe 10,000 developers or so, uh, active a lot less. Uh, number of projects, maybe like 250 that we came in contact with. Uh, projects with adoption maybe like 12 or 20 was like meaningful adoption so we're like very early I would say um, and and so what's needed is both good tooling so like tooling should from our perspective should look and feel more like web 2 backends so we talk to the guys from Pars from Heroku like if you talk to a co-founder of Heroku he would say like hey like can I spin up your blockchain with like five lines of code and we're like no he's like well come back when you can <laughs> that, that's like very aspirational, you know, but like, no, nobody's there. We're not there, but like, that that, that's people like. <laughs> <laughs> yep. Um, and, and then on usability, it, uh, I think it all starts with onboarding, uh, but it also then goes into abstracting away transactions, abstracting away public private keys from users. Uh, those things also, by the way, should be done directly on a protocol level. I think the same goes for Ethereum Foundation and next version of Ethereum, I think all these improvements should be done directly on the protocol level. So it doesn't have to be that hundreds of uh, applications have to implement it over and over again. Um, you kind of have the benefit of looking at, at the space for the last two or three years, kind of seeing what went wrong with usability and, and kind of like directly uh, in, improve all of this directly on the protocol level, uh, as opposed to have kind of like hodgepodge of um, improvements. This is, you know? um, yeah, Sasha, thank you for sharing. This is definitely something that I thought a great deal about when I was working on Ethereum and like it comes up now in uh, the project I'm working on today, which is called Space Mesh, which is another layer one protocol. Uh, and, and it's I, here, here's the thought I wanted to share. Like as a core developer, what I've noticed is that um, most core developers tend to regard the layer one as like a neutral thing. They're like, I'm just building this thing and I just need to, it can be very simple and very basic. I need to get the VM working and get the security working and these sorts of things. And like, like they're not thinking in product terms. They're not thinking about users. They're not thinking about UX. Uh, I, I do think that Near is relatively unique in this respect, that you guys are sort of prioritizing product and user stuff from the very beginning. And there's like like one of the things that I liked about uh, Near when I learned about it was, um, help me out here, you have like a sort of um, uh, like, like, like actually going back to Denison, you, you mentioned this, this issue earlier, you know, like, oh, I have to authorize an application to like spend die on my, on my behalf. You guys are doing like an OAuth style thing, right? Where I can like authorize a particular application to perform a particular set of actions on my behalf. And then that 
permission just lasts forever. Like that is a really cool feature. Mm -hmm. Yeah, exactly. So you actually don't yeah don't need to do it over mm -hmm. and over again. It's kind of like you can set it up as a default and. So anyway, it. I'm agreeing with you. I yep. think that having protocol layer level one, uh, layer one layer support for for UX is absolutely essential out of the gate. It's like a, a battle that I'll keep on fighting at Space Mesh and the other projects I'm involved in. But it's it's really cool to have you guys set the example. Well, actually, Lane, mm -hmm. to sort of follow that up with a question, uh, where do we stop in terms of building that into the protocol level? Right, yeah, like question. should we build? email recovery into the protocol level and this is like a you know genuine question right like where at what point like where do we and this is for everyone like where do we we stop in terms of like building in at the protocol layer because you know when you look at new new projects like uh, uh, I was who was I looking at maybe I was looking at Blockstack where they have like native support for like ERC721 style non-fungible tokens right is that a good thing Right, like that these things are built in the protocol level. Are we going to wake up five years from now and everyone's just like, oh my God, we can't scale because it's built into the protocol? You here, know? Here, so, my 10, second, my 10 second thought on this is that the protocol should be as simple as possible, but no simpler. Uh, and, you know, the protocol is by definition a promise, a contract that's being made not just between sort of the core developers and everyone else who will ever build on the protocol, but like among all the parties and the software that will be running it, you can't remove something from protocol. Uh, and so the question is just what is, I mean, it's, it's an art, not a science, right? What is the really bare bones set of primitives that you need? I, yeah, that's my 10 seconds, 20 seconds. What do other people think? I think, uh, I think we're, we're, we have three minutes left. I don't know how the end of these things happen. I, I, I don't think it's a hard stop. I, you can kind of run over a little bit in my experience, but like to be respectful, I, mean, I think we have, I think Vitalik or someone is on in three minutes. Yeah, I think I Vitalik is gonna talk in like three minutes. I hope the room doesn't get too packed and we can't join. <laughs> you know, it's packed, you know, we can't, you know. Uh, thank you everyone. I, you know, I, I guess I'll, 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 you know, wrap it up here so we can all like pee for a minute and like, you know, jump to the other ones. Thanks everyone. Thank you, my moderation panel for showing up. This is awesome. I'm um, glad I didn't just talk at a, blank screen. Um, thanks everyone in the, the session with their comments. Uh, Bitcoin Jack, I believe. Bitcoin Jack. Uh, thank you because those are yeah. those are some really relevant salient points that that uh, I wish I had answers to and I think we're all trying to find answers to um, because you know as my sort of final point the the first thing I, I heard as an application for Bitcoin was we'll have donation buttons on websites where you can just donate Bitcoin directly to them. And it's ten years later, and there's there's still no donation buttons. Oh, um, right, and I just finished the talk on Brave and Bad, and sort of have this coming. Okay, you know what? <laughs> really, fair it enough. works. You can, like even on Twitter, it's like, cool. Yeah. Okay. Fair enough. Fair enough. So you got that's it. A, ten years later, you got it. <laughs> ten years later, we got it. We got it. Yes. What is the one thing we must have in another ten years? What do you guys think? Oh wow. This is like the genie question. What do we want? Pick it wisely. Gosh, that's a really good question. I want to see the like, games come so far. I just want to see like, yeah, yeah. I just, I really want to be able to own the items and be able to move them. You know, someone someone in the chat said no coronavirus. I'm I'm into that. I'm not sure. About that. Yeah, yeah, I'm into that. <laughs> in ten years, I want to be years. able to go outside. <laughs> you know, start small. That'd be great. Monetize personal data. Yeah, you know, actually, I just want to secure my personal data. Okay, I know what I want. In the next ten years, I would like to be able to keep all my personal data physically in some of my own space. Yeah. I don't want to have to like say Alexa turn on the lights and I have to go to San Francisco to some server and then back to my light bulb, right? And and I don't want that for anything. I want the connection between my data and the things I do in my life to live with me. That's a good You know point. what I want? I want voting. Voting would be huge. Like for us to be able to vote uh 10 years from now on the blockchain. That would be great. Yes. Yeah. Absolutely, voting on the block. That's what I want. I changed it's my final. answer. I want a presidential elections where we just vote. Exactly. 
from home. Ten years is probably too soon. Um, I, I see on the stage icon light up that says live, so I'm going to hop over there. Thank you very much. Yeah. Everyone. everyone, thank you so much. Uh, I guess I'm just going to leave. I don't know if this all disappears <laughs> or what. So thanks, everyone. See you guys later. Thank <laughs> you.